Ever wonder what a stretch tire looks like on a six and a half inch wheel? An object's moment of inertia is its resistance to changing angular velocity. Basically, it takes energy to make something spin. And the more that something weighs and the further that weight is from the center, well, it's just gonna take more energy to spin it up. Now this pertains to every single part on the car. So energy you're putting into making something spin is energy being taken away from driving the car forward. Now there's a lot of mathematical equations that go into this, but we can use a pretty simple rule of thumb where we double the amount of energy needed to make something spin. So to put it simply, we can take a, a weight of a rotating object and just times it by two. And you know, we can use this for like our rough power to weight calculations. Now, if you really wanna dive into this subject, there's a ton of information out there on YouTube and online, but we're not really gonna get into it now, but this will kind of help us later on. So now with that said, let's talk about brakes, wheels, and tires. Because when you're talking about a land speed car, there's a lot of things to take into consideration. And really most of the parts available are for a completely different application. Now each have their pros and cons, but they're all affected by one thing, rotational mass. Now let's talk about brakes. Uh, brakes may not seem all that important on a land speed car. I mean, this isn't time attack. We're going for a land speed record, right? Wouldn't no brakes be best? They had a significant amount of rotational mass, complexity via the hydraulic system, and really they can just add friction and drag, ultimately slowing us down even when we're not using them. And in reality, we may not even use the brakes assuming everything goes well, but what happens when everything doesn't go well? Now, in the event that the vehicle gets out of control, the brakes are going to play a pivotal role in keeping the nose pointed forward and the roof off the salt, uh, assuming you have the right equipment. So we reached out to our friends at Faction Fab and they sent over their full brake kit. For the rotors, we're using their new swept slot design. Now these are specifically designed to keep the brake pad face nice and clean. So should we ever come into a situation where we need to stop quickly, it's just gonna ensure that there's nothing getting in the way between the rotor and the brake pad, you know, when we need it the most. For the brake pads, we're using their F-Spec pads. Now they have very good pedal feedback, so you can reach threshold braking without locking up the tires, which is critical, especially on a very slippery surface like the salt flats. And we're running their stainless steel brake lines. Now we chose these for the strength, the coating, and the excellent corrosion resistance, but honestly, it's probably gonna add quite a bit to the brake feedback as well. Now, ideally we should never have to use the brake setup, but if we're going to, I wanna make sure that it's adequate and not only adequate, but overkill. Now, safety reasons aside, there is one main reason that I wanted this particular brake setup. That's just the spirit of the class. This is a production class we're racing in. So we got the OEM four pot front, two pot rear brake calipers, as these were factory equipped on the version six STI. There is one thing. Oh yeah, these brakes just happen to be kind of the go-to brakes for most rally cars, which means that a lot of wheel manufacturers have very specialized wheels designed specifically for these brakes, which is gonna be very advantageous when it comes to tires. Now, like I've said before, racing out at Bonneville is completely different than racing anywhere else. And same goes for the tires. Now, as always, traction is key, but what works for the street doesn't always translate to the salt. One thing you have to take into account is the amount of rolling resistance and drag that you're gonna get from your tire, especially when you're trying to hit maximum speed. Now, racing out at the salt is very similar to driving in the snow, and you can get traction in the same way by running a narrow tire inflated to a high pressure. Now, I know it sounds backwards, but by running a narrow tire, we're effectively trying to reduce the contact patch as much as possible, thereby focusing the weight of a car onto a much smaller area. Now, we can also increase the tire's pressure to the maximum manufacturer recommendation, thereby further focusing that contact patch even more. The smaller the contact patch, the less the rolling resistance, and the frontal area of a skinny tire is also gonna offer less drag. Competitors wanting to achieve or exceed that magical 200 mile an hour mark are looking for the tires with the absolute lowest rolling resistance 
and drag. And a common choice is the front runners. These are those super skinny tires that you're gonna find on the front end of top fuel drag cars, and they're typically only about four or five inches wide. Now, for racers wanting to go even faster, say 300 plus miles an hour, well, they do make tires specifically for them as well. But there's one thing that all of these tires have in common, is that they're designed to roll along the ground using the least amount of energy possible. In addition to being narrow, you'll notice that they all kind of share a similar tread design, which is somewhat round, like a motorcycle tire. Now, with anything built for a very specific purpose, you're always going to have trade-offs. So some of these high-speed land cars can easily spin the tires in excess of 150 miles an hour, which makes precise throttle modulation even more important than absolute power. So you've probably already noticed we don't really like to do things the same as everybody else, and well, we decided we're not going to run the front runners. But we did notice something. When looking up the records for other production classes, almost all of the records held by small displacement cars, almost all of them were all-wheel drive cars. So it got us thinking, if traction is really that important, well, we could probably use a little bit more grip than what those front runners could provide. So here's the thing. In a car shaped like a brick with only one liter of displacement, we're just not gonna have the power to accelerate very quickly once we get up over 100 miles an hour. So we want to accelerate as quickly as possible and then basically crawl our way to a new land speed record. And a Subaru Rally car gave us an idea. If you've ever seen a Rally snow tire, then you know exactly what we're thinking. These tires are incredibly narrow with a section width usually between 155 and 165, which is actually a little bit wider than the front runner tires, but they have an incredibly aggressive tread pattern for maximum traction on snow and ice. But unfortunately, there were a few obstacles and drawbacks that meant we weren't gonna be able to run actual rally tires. They are a race only tire. And unfortunately, they don't have a speed rating either, which means that the race organizers out there probably aren't gonna let us run them. And we don't wanna risk going all the way out there just to not be able to run. Another reason is that rally tires and well, racing tires in general, well, they're super expensive. And we are on a pretty tight budget, which would mean we'd have to cut corners other places. As you guys know, I've been living off ramen since this project started, and I'm just not willing to go to the generic brand. Sorry. And one last reason is the rally tires are tall. They're 25 and a half inches tall, which may not seem like much, and the taller tire will help reduce friction loss on the salt, but every inch of tire that we gain, the car goes up one half of an inch. Now, we'll get into aerodynamics in a later episode, but we want this car to be as low as possible to the ground to improve airflow around it. So what did we decide? Well, after spending probably way too much time digging around on the internet, figuring out all of our options, we finally found a tire that will fit our needs. The 145-65R15 Dunlop Enesave 01 All Seasons. These are the tires you're gonna find on the little Mitsubishi Electric Maya. Me, me. Now you might be wondering why. Well, there's a few reasons. One is they're designed from the ground up to be an ultra low rolling resistance tire. And they still have a tread design which promotes traction in both snow and ice and well, all conditions with minimal energy loss. All of that sounds pretty good, but I sound like a Dunlop spokesperson. The real reason is these tires are as narrow as a rally snow tire with a tread width of about four and a half to five inches. Plus they're just as small and light as a Draxxer front runner, weighing in at 12.2 pounds and about 22.4 inches in diameter. Plus the main thing, well, they've got a DOT stamp, which means they're street legal. And that means that they have an actual speed rating so we should be legal to race. When we were shopping around for tires, we were mainly comparing everything against the factory version six STI. Well, with these little eco-friendly Dunlops, we narrowed our contact patch by about one and a half inches. And we also reduced the overall diameter by about two and a half inches. And as a benefit, that's gonna lower the car almost a full inch and a half before we even touch the suspension. And one of the biggest things is the weight loss. These weigh 7.8 pounds less than the factory STI tires, per corner. That's 31.2 pounds all around. Using our two to one rule of thumb that we were talking about in the beginning, well, that's 62.4 pounds just from the tires alone. 
The version 6 STI came with 16 by 7 inch wheels from the factory, weighing in at about 16 and a half pounds. Now that's pretty light, but our friends, Ray's Engineering, knows a thing or two about making lightweight racing wheels. This is the Volk TE37, and perhaps one of our favorite wheels of all time. And specifically, this is the Volk TE37 Gravel. And they call it that because it's designed from the ground up to handle all the abuse from rally competition. And they do this through a process called forging, and that is one of the best ways to make a wheel. Now, during this forging process, they use a giant press to basically smash things together until the force causes the internal granular structure of the aluminum to align with the shape of the wheel. And all of this makes it incredibly strong. Now, our wheels are 15 by six and a half inches and weigh a scant 10.8 pounds, which makes it one of the strongest and one of the lightest wheels we can possibly get for the Subaru. Now I should make it clear, forging doesn't actually make the wheel any lighter by itself, but now the wheel is able to be manufactured using less materials while still being stronger than a heavy cast wheel. As we talked about before, the lighter something is and the closer that mass is to the center, well, the easier it is to get spinning. And with most of the mass that affects the moment of inertia sitting way out on the barrel of the wheel, well, dropping down to an even smaller size allows us to overcome even more rotational resistance. It may not seem like much, but when you add everything up and times it by all four wheels, well, that's 22 pounds of rotational mass removed from the outside of the wheel. And if you use our two to one calculation, that's 44 pounds of weight we've just removed off the car. So let's add it all up. 62.4 pounds from the tires, 44 pounds from the wheels, that's equivalent to 106.4 pounds of reciprocating mass that we've removed from the car. I know this setup as a whole isn't really gonna scratch the itch from our stance friends, and it's certainly not gonna provide, well, just about any grip for track use. But if you're trying to break a world record on the salt in a one liter Subaru, well, then it's just about perfect. And that's it guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you want to see more about this build and our attempt to break a land speed record, well, hit the subscribe button and the little bell icon so you'll be notified when we come out with a new video. And of course, make sure to follow us across our social media channels. But I thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, hit the thumbs up. If you didn't, well, you can hit that thumbs down button, but we'll see you next time.